Welcome, my bells and bats. My name is Sheena Peril. I am an author and knitwear designer from the Pacific Northwest, and this is my monthly podcast where we talk about what I'm knitting, what I'm writing, what I'm reading, um, just kind of, you know, all that creative stuff that I'm working on right now. And then we follow it up with a spooky tale. Um, before we get started, I do just want to say that, as many of you know, I live on a flight path. The planes have been in rare form this morning and have just been going by every 30 seconds. So please forgive any jump cuts or background noise that you might hear in this episode because there is, there's nothing I can do about it. I can't control SeaTac. So something new that I have started doing is doing a card pull from one of my many textile themed tarot and oracle decks before we start the podcast. So this week I am using the Knitter's Oracle which is by Wild Hunt Designs and I will post a link down below. Um, this is the pre-order edition and I think that there are two more after this. I'm not sure if she's still only doing these by pre-order or if they're like in stock now, but she has one that is the gold foil, one that's silver, and I think she might have one that's a hollow foil now. I'm not positive. Anyway, I'll link it down below. So our card for this week is the hook. So let me just see what the little pamphlet on here says, because I haven't worked with this deck very much. So the hook is stability, longevity, and anchor, dura durability, tenacity, safety, and steadfastness, which I think that's a pretty accurate description of crochet. Um, it's a little bit more rigid than knitting, so. This is a very fun deck to play with, and I think this was the second one I got in my collection. I'm not positive. So since last time, um, my temp job has ended, so I'm on author time now, which means that I am putting all of my time and energy into writing, filming, um, just all that stuff to try and boost up my career a little bit so that I can get additional re revenue streams going. To that end, if you could like, subscribe, interact with this video in some way so I can ha have a better chance of finding my audience, then that would be great. Um, also, don't forget to check out the links down below. You can also find a link to pre-order my next book, Midnight Radio, which comes out on April 22nd. So yeah, basically I've just been working on like filming stuff, research, brainstorming. I kind of took this past week, which was the first week I had off, and was using it to sort of get my head together, plan stuff, do some preliminary research, figure out what my goals for this period are going to be. I don't know how long author time lasts. I never know. It might be a couple days. It might be months. Uh, it just depends on when the temp agency gets back to me. So I'm currently expecting it to be about two months, which is an average. So that gives me eight weeks to get things done. And I'm hoping to do things like film ahead for this channel and also get podcast episodes recorded for my true crime podcast, The Ghosts of Highway 16, which again, you'll find the link down below. Um, work on editing and uh, formatting and all of that good stuff. So that is what I'm working on primarily right now. I'm also hoping that I can put out at least one to two patterns in the next two months. Um, because again, just trying to get as many revenue streams going as possible while I am unemployed. Um, other than that though, there has not been a whole lot going on in my life. Um, so let's go ahead and just jump into my finished objects. Okay, so as I mentioned in the last episode, I kind of fell down a nostalgia rabbit hole 
and got back into the American Girl stuff. So it started with getting down my Kirsten doll and I just wanted to like dust her off, clean her up, make sure that she wasn't getting any direct sunlight or anything like that. There was no fading on her dress, which it's fine. Um, and that kind of snowballed. <laughs> so I ended up ordering her a new dress. This is a reproduction of her school dress. And then currently all of her accessories are in storage with my mom. So I made her a new apron just to try and help prevent any fading. And this apron is covered in cat hair right now because very adorably my cat Hermes likes to lay in her lap and it is so freaking cute. Um, also, she now has a snood because when I took down her hair to kind of brush it out, get the dust off, um, either from age or light damage, I'm not sure which, um, her hair is actually shattering. So it's just breaking off little tiny pieces every time I brush her hair. So I didn't want to put it back in the braids and damage it further. So it's now loose and I've got a snood over it to protect it. So now she just looks like she is a little bit older, but from the same period still. And I could do a whole video about Kirsten and why she's my favorite. And her books are the reason that I'm a writer, basically. So it's very important to me. It's very special to me. And then the other thing that I made her, again, to try and help prevent any fading is a little shawl to go over her. And this is based on the Raina shawl, which I could have sworn I took care of those ends, but whatever, they're all close. Um, so it's the same pattern basically, but I did cast on 10 stitches instead of, I think it calls for four or five, just so that I can make it a little bit wider and shallower to be more proportionate with the doll. So this shawl actually goes with her meat dress. So really that's the only finished, finished objects that I have this week. That is because I have been putting all of my energy into the Rainbow Sweater 2.0. I finished the body and in a minute here I'm going to switch to a different view where I've got this spread out so you can actually see it because it's too big for me to put on camera here. Um, but I did finish the body. I'm taking a break from it before I start on the sleeves, but I am so happy with how this turned out. Um, this is Lion Brand Mandala in the colorway Gnome, and uh, I recently discovered that the Mandala comes in two different size skeins. So there are cakes, however you want to describe it. So the, the original is, let me check the ball band here. The original is 150 grams, and then there's also a bigger version that is 300 grams. So um, what this is, this is two of the original size balls. And then I was convinced I was going to run out of yarn. So I bought two of the big balls. And the nice thing about that is because it's the same color progression through both of them, it doesn't have a second repeat in the big ball. It's just a longer version of the original. That means that my stripes were more consistent throughout the body. Um, now for the sleeves, I'm going to switch back to the regular size cakes, um, but I do still have plans for using up the remaining larger ones because I'm going to have leftover yarn now. I'm definitely going to have leftover yarn. Um, if I had not used the big skeins, I might have run out, but um, I'm, I'm definitely going to have leftovers now. <laughs> A lot of leftovers. Can we just take a minute to appreciate how satisfying this color progression is? So this is two of the regular size skeins of the gnome and then one of the jumbo skeins and I only got about halfway through it. 
Um, and the reason I did that was to keep the stripe width a little bit more consistent throughout. But anyway, this will lay flat once it is blocked. I've stretched it out a little bit and checked to make sure. Um, it just, it's not doing it right now because it's unblocked. So the way that this uh, center portion works, which is basically a circular afghan, is you start out in the center, cast on six stitches, knit every stitch, and then increase every stitch. Knit a row, increase every other stitch. Knit a row, increase every third stitch. And you keep doing that until it gets to be ginormous. I was looking for a 60 centimeter, I'm sorry, 60 inch diameter. So when I was a little bit short of that, I switched from stockinette to ribbing just to help a little bit with that curl and make it sit a little bit nicer. And now the body is done. So I'm going to be taking a break from this project for a little while just because this was kind of intense. And then what I'll do is once it's blocked, I'm going to lay the original sweater on top. So that way I can use it as a guide for marking where my sleeves are going to go. And I'm not putting them in the exact same spot. I need to adjust that a little bit, but it's going to give me a rough guide for how far apart they need to be and how far down on the circle. Okay, the next thing that I'm working on is a shawl. And this is take three. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm currently making the Platamon shawl. I have no idea how to say that. It is by Alexandra Nietzsche, and it was a free pattern on Ravelry. And I know it's pretty unusual for me to use patterns. I did a whole video about one of the reasons why I don't. Um, but I am trying to figure out different shawl shapes. And one of the ones that I've been wanting to make is like a crescent or a semicircular type of shawl. I know how to make triangle shawls. I make them all the time, but I wanted something more crescent shaped. So I'm using this as a model to get an idea for like how the increases work and everything. And originally I was using a tutorial that I found on YouTube for doing a pie shawl or a half pie shawl. And I really didn't like it. I did not like the way that it was coming out. It was curling really bad. Um, the edging that I was doing to follow their instructions was not wide enough to mitigate the curling. And it was coming out in like a weird triangle shape instead of a crescent. So I ditched that. I ripped it all out. I had knit up almost a full skein of yarn and just decided I'm not going to do that. So I cast this on last night. And this is just the beginning here. And this is going to be a fade shawl. So this is Quantum Entanglement's Goddess Yarn in the colorway Thalassa, which this was part of my um, unemployment that I got. Um, I had severance payment from my last job, my last full-time job. And so I took part of my severance pay on a yarn crawl. <laughs> And this was one of the colors that I got. And I believe this came from Stranded by the Sea. I don't remember. But I'm pretty sure it was Stranded by the Sea, which is an LYS in Edmonton. Um, and it's north of Seattle. So it's a ways away. I would love to go back there. But it, it's a haul for me to get there. And then from this, we go into this. This is a planned pooling yarn that I got at Red Alder, and this is Dragonfly Fibers, and the colorway is Damsel, and it is a planned pooling yarn. And the first time I cast on for a shawl, I actually started with this, and then once I saw the colors next to each other, I'm like, oh yeah this needs to be the second color not the first one um and this is not the whole skein there was an incident with the ball winder at the festival um 
and then I found a factory knot in the skein. So it's now in three pieces. That was fun. And then the last two yarns that I'm going to be using are Sweet Georgia Tough Love Sock in the colorway Fizzy Water. And then I have Brew City Yarns in Lucky Charms Mare in the Moon. So this came from my uh, not so LYS back in Ohio, um, my hometown where I was raised finally got a yarn shop about three months before I moved away. Um, so this came from that shop, which I can't remember the name of, but I'll link it down below because it's, it's a really great shop. It's in London, Ohio, and uh, she specializes in local yarns. So this one is local-ish to London, Ohio. I think she does all Ohio yarns, but specializes in more local stuff. I don't remember now. And then uh, this, I believe, also came from my uh, unemployed yarn crawl. It might have come from Red Alder last year. I don't remember. One of the two. So this is what the color progression is going to be. And I'm really happy with that. Um, so this is going to be a huge shawl. Huge. I'm knitting it on these 3.25s, no, these are fours, 3.5 millimeter size four needles. And this is going to be a schlanket, as many people call them, a shawl slash blanket. I call them socially acceptable blankets because when you would really rather be walking around wrapped in your comforter in your pajamas, but you have to go to the office, this is the type of shawl you want to reach for. So I've started on that again. Hopefully this will be my final cast on because I really don't want to do it again. And if I hadn't cast on so many times, I would be on the third stain of yarn by now. Like that is how far I was getting into it each time before I decided I didn't like it. My only other finished object is the bubblegum socks. I now have a finished pair. And this is Geektastic Fibers in the color Saturday. It's on their superhero sock base. And this was just using up some leftovers. It's um, my basic vanilla sock recipe. Um, I just turned it into shorty socks because that was all the yarn that I had. I'm looking at my notes now and I've done all of my projects out of order. <laughs> I was supposed to do finished objects and then whips and I got them totally mixed up but anyway I have one more project to show you that is the Eleonora project. Okay correction I have two projects to show you. So this is the Eleonora project. This is my experimental archaeology recreation of a 16th century burial stocking found in the tomb of Eleonora de Toledo in Florence, Italy. And I have done the heel. I'm now working on the foot. And um, each of these like garter ridges is a repeat. This isn't true garter stitch. This is two rows of knit, two rows of pearl. Um, but each of these ridges is a repeat and I need 12 of those repeats before I start the decreases for the toe. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Like it, it's not something I would do for myself, but based on the evidence that I have on the photos, on the written records, this is the best I can get on the pattern. Um, and I'm thinking slash hoping that once the sock was worn, this area right here would kind of smooth out a little bit and then the sock would kind of naturally curve. 
I can't find evidence of any shaping when I look at the photos. So I'm not seeing any changes along this edge that would curve the foot this way. And I'm not seeing anything over here that would indicate a curve because this whole section right here is missing in the originals. So I'm doing my best with the information that I have available. I'm kind of winging it, um, but these are very close to being done. And I keep, I've been saying that I'm going to finish them this month since December. I was going to finish them before the end of the year. I was going to finish them in January. I was going to finish them by the end of February. I can definitely finish these this month. I definitely can, especially if I'm not working. So I do need to sit down and work on these. Um, yeah, th this is, this is a high priority knit for me this month because I want these off the needles. I think these, I've been working on them for two years at this point because triple zero needles. I'm also hoping the yarn holds out because this is all that's left. The last thing that I have to show you is actually on hiatus because I ran out of yarn. So this is the fox hood that I started for Ash. And I think last time I just had this cowl section done. I am now about two thirds of the way through the hood and I ran out of this mahogany color right here. Um, this is double knit. And I am using Valley Yarns, which is by Webs. The yarn is called Holly, H-A-W-L-E-Y. I, I cannot pronounce that. It comes out as Holly, like the plant every single time. I, I don't know how that should be pronounced otherwise. Um, this is 50% cotton, 30% silk, 20% nylon. And what else can I tell you about it? Um, the purple is crushed velvet, and then the tan is called mahogany for some reason. This is not what mahogany looks like. Um, it's an improvised pattern based off of like three different versions of the fox hoods that I've seen online. Um, Ash had several requests for her fox hood, and that meant combining patterns basically. So this is a combination of one knit pattern and two different crocheted patterns that I'm sort of meshing together to make this. Um, but this is on hold indefinitely because since I am unemployed, I don't know when we'll be getting more yarn for this. Okay, so we do have some acquisitions here. Um, last month, February 17th, I was at the Red Alder Fiber Arts Retreat in Tacoma, Washington, and I didn't get to do as much there as I would have liked. Again, because of the whole unemployment thing, I wasn't able to take any classes, but I did go for the Saturday and just kind of like hang out, chat with people, knit on stuff, and buy yarn. And this was something that I had planned in advance. I've been planning on Red Alder since last Red Alder. So I did have money set aside specifically for this. And this is also probably my last yarn haul until like November, um, just because I tend to buy a lot of yarn leading up to and right after Christmas and then nothing the rest of the year unless it's like an oddball skein that I need to finish a project. So uh, first of all, we had the uh, Dragonfly fibers that I've already got balled up for the shawl. And then um, I went in looking for a specific type of yarn, um, which is to say I have a scrap project that I'm working on that uh, I need lighter colors for because it has a black border. And if I use my normal color palette, most of the yarns will not show up against that border. You won't be able to tell the difference or it'll be aqua because aqua is my favorite color. So I was trying to focus on lighter colored yarns and specifically 
uh, things that I could use for this project. So um, I got several regular size skeins of yarn that I will use for other things and then use the leftovers for that project. And I love these. This is alpaca sock yarn. It is by Happy Hounds Alpaca Ranch. It is 70% baby alpaca, 30% silk. <coughs> uh, it's four ply fingering, 437 yards. This is the color indigo. And this one is red velvet. And it's showing up kind of orange on screen. It's, um, it's more of a cool red. It's got a little bit more, um, just the slightest bit of a blue undertone to it. All right. Um, also from Dragonfly Fibers, I got this mini skein set. This is Spring Fling. Uh, William Merino, 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon, and the big one is 230 yards, the little one is 93 yards. Um, and these mini skeins, I don't remember where I got them, and they don't have labels on them, but these I got specifically for that project because I needed more warm colors and more brights. Um, I was looking mostly at, I realized I was looking mostly at like pastels and again, aqua and purple because I have a color palette. I can't help it. Um, so I needed to get some colors that were outside my comfort zone in order to make this project work. And the reason I'm being kind of cagey about that project is because it's a gift for someone who may or may not watch this channel. So, um, I have two secret projects that are going to be coming up in the near future. Uh, I also went back to Geektastic and originally I wasn't going to buy anything from them. Like I did look, I just didn't find anything that was really talking to me. Um, and then I happened to be walking past in a different direction and I found their orphan bin. So this was the last skein left. It's again, superhero socks. So the same base as the bubblegum socks I just finished up and the colorway is Lumity. And then this one I actually wanted to get last year, but I ran out of money. Um, so this is Nano Stitch Lab and it's their scientific sock base, which is a merino nylon 7525, and the colorway is called Orion Nebula. So I really love this one. I'm sad I didn't get it last year, but I'm glad I got it this time. There is a sticker booth at Red Alder that comes every year. I have forgotten their names. I don't apparently have one of their business cards, but I got a couple stickers from them last year and I was so happy to see them again this year. So I got a little knitting ghost, which is me. I, I am a little ghost. <laughs> and then I also got this, which is a crow on a book with crystals and candles and yarn and it's just so witchy and perfect and I love it. I also got a free patch and the last thing that I got is less interesting but um, there was one booth that had a good selection of needles. But, phew, And I happened to see my favorite sock needles there, which are the Chow Goos, fixed circulars, size one. And she had them in 24 inch length, which is great for socks. Um, and I have a cat who is wire cutters on four paws. Just to illustrate, 
This is the charger for my watch. I found it like this this morning because she was unhappy at the amount of attention her brother was getting, so she just chomped through the cord in one bite. She does this to my sock needles a lot. She doesn't necessarily cut them in half because they're stronger than a charging cable, but um, she'll chew up that plastic and then it catches on the yarn. Sometimes it gets very, very sharp. It's like little teeth sticking up and I have cut myself on those little teeth. I have torn yarn on those teeth. Um, it's very hard to knit in the round when your needle is covered in teeth. So I went ahead and I stocked up and got three Chowgu US size one 24 inch circular needles. And I started to walk past the booth, saw these needles, went in, grabbed everything that was on the peg, handed them to the lady and said, I would like these. And she's like, oh, did you find what you're looking for? And she was very confused because they're all the same. So then I had to explain about the fact that I have a pet wire cutter and I have to keep these in bulk, otherwise I won't be able to knit socks. This is one of the reasons why I like air changeable needles so much because then I can just swap out the cable and buy additional cables as needed. So that is the haul from Red Alder. I did go to the dinner and the keynote, which was really good. Um, the food was really good, but I will say that they need to make the actual menu available ahead of time because they were having issues with allergies. All they told us was what the protein was. Um, they didn't say like, oh, this has a cream sauce on it, which there was somebody who was lactose intolerant and had to have their menu changed or this sauce has walnuts in it and somebody had a nut allergy. So that was my biggest complaint about it was the food issue. Um, just because as somebody who has food allergies, it can be very difficult for me to plan if I don't know what the food options are. But all in all, it was really good. I got the salmon, which was delicious. Um, there was also a chocolate cake that pretty much everybody got. Like there were other options for desserts and everybody got the chocolate cake. Um, and again, with the allergy stuff, it looked like they were just bringing you a chocolate cake, but then you would take a piece and realized that it was sitting on a small bed of strawberry sauce. And my first thought is, oh, this would be horrible if mom was here because my mom is allergic to strawberries. So um, again, like just label your allergens. Let us know what we're having first. You know, save everybody the hassle of making last minute changes or having to use an EpiPen, okay? Like, that's all I'm asking, really. Um, I do think that this year was better than last year. For starters, last year, for some reason, the hotel was 90 degrees inside. It was so hot. Everybody was peeling off layers. And I mean, it's a knitting convention. Everybody wants to wear their sweaters and their shawls and their hats and all the fun stuff they've made. And I was standing outside in a t-shirt fanning myself in the snow at one point because it was so hot in the vendor's room. Um, we had like, the vendors couldn't leave obviously because they had to tend to their booths. So there were like patrons coming in and bringing them ice water and stuff so that they could try to stay cool because there was one vendor that I think was about to pass out at one point. Um, but anyway, they solved that this year. It was, it was still warm but it was tolerable. Um, and then we went down for the dinner. I had like a gap in between where I sat down and I got some writing and editing done. Um, but it was just a lot of fun. I really enjoyed my table mates at the dinner and the keynote speaker was very fun. It was, um, 
oh shoot, I can't remember her name now. I'll list it down below, but she is the editor of Spinoff Magazine. And she has a sheep and that sheep is, I think, related to Gwyd because she was telling baby stories about him as a lamb and a bottle baby being raised in her laundry room. And um, I think he might be related to my cat because they have a lot in common. <laughs> okay, so what have I been reading lately? Um, like I said, I fell down the American Girl rabbit hole and I've been listening to audio versions of the books that I grew up with as well as a couple of later books that came out that I was curious about and it has been so nice going back to something that was so formative in my youth and it's really helping me to like refill that well and remember why I'm doing this and I've really needed that lately. Um, I've really been struggling with my writing. Last fall, I was about ready to quit. Um, it was just not going well and I'm still struggling. But rereading that and remembering why I do this and why I put myself through this um, has just been really helpful. And along that same vein, I've been continuing my reread of The Spider's Web, which was my first novel that came out came out in 2016 and I have not read it since um and there's a reason for that like by the time I have finished editing something I've read it so many times I never want to see that book again but I haven't read this one in years so I went back and I'm rereading it and seeing Evie the heroine develop has been so great um I wrote that book because I was in a very dark place. I had undiagnosed depression, undiagnosed anxiety, undiagnosed autism and ADHD. I was really struggling to make friends and relate to the people around me. So I wasn't in a good place and I wanted to read a book where the hero isn't all like, you know, gung-ho, let's go defeat the bad guy. You know, someone who struggles with, I really don't want to do this, but it's something that has to happen. Um, and her book has gone through a lot of iterations and changes. It's been completely rewritten at least seven times. Going back to reread this, it's just been so great because it reminds me of where I started and where I am now. And I feel like I can't be the only one who sometimes you need a hero who can't get out of bed. Like you need someone who is destined to save the world, but really just kind of wants to curl up in their room with a pint of ice cream and ignore everything. So that has been just a wonderful experience. I think I have one chapter left uh, to finish reading. Um, but yeah, that's been really wonderful to go back to. Um, I also finished reading uh, the Heroine's Journey by Gail Carriger. Uh, I had started this about a month ago or two months ago and then my library hold ran out so I had to wait for it to come back in before I could finish it. That book, I said it before, it should be required reading for all English composition classes from like freshman year of high school or ninth grade up through college level just because it goes into so much. And I took all like AP and specialized in advanced writing classes in high school and college. And I took writing classes outside of that, but nobody ever covered the hero's journey. Like I didn't start hearing about that until, I don't know, years after I graduated and I heard about it because of NaNoWriMo. So getting that breakdown 
of the hero's journey and then the heroine's journey and how they're different and how they're similar, that has been really groundbreaking for me. Um, and I, I don't know how I missed out on this in my education. Um, actually, I know exactly when the first time I heard about it was. Um, it was July of 2017. And I know this because it was the month that I didn't sleep because it was right before I got my hypothyroid diagnosis. And if you didn't know, when your thyroid isn't working correctly, um, if it's hypothyroid, which means it doesn't function enough, it can, right before it goes into total collapse, go into hyperthyroid. So it produces too much of the chemicals. So I was in that period for July and I did not sleep that month. I got maybe like one to two hours of sleep a night and that was it. And I was exhausted all the time, but that was when I really started putting something on in the background to help me sleep. And I was watching Myths and Monsters on Netflix because the narrator is, is very soothing. So that was my first introduction to it. And I kind of earmarked it to come back to for later, but it just, it felt too complicated and I couldn't wrap my head around it. And the way that Gail breaks this down makes so much more sense than every other place that I have looked at to research to find the, the plot arc and the beats for it. Um, and it's only been in the last couple of years that I've started using things like the hero's journey because when I'm writing my cozy series, I use those uh, plot points as a guide because cozy mysteries tend to be more formulaic. I don't use it in my regular novels just because it, they don't fit really with what I want to write. Um, my, bra my brain is weird. I write cross-genre fiction and it, it, it's just different, okay? But it turns out that I've been using a form of the heroine's journey this whole time. So, long story short, if you like Gail Carriker, if you like the found family in her books, then consider checking out mine because that's something that comes up a lot. Um, specifically, I would point you towards Off the Rails which is an adult historical mystery with ghosts um, because the main character in that, Sophia Andrews, basically adopts everyone that she comes across who needs help. <laughs> um, I really want to give her a second book, but it just has not come together. The plot isn't working. Um, but yeah, she just adopts everyone and takes care of them. And she's like, oh, you've been suffering? I'm going to take care of that. You don't need to worry now. And she just does that for everyone because she has money and she can do that. Anyway. <laughs> um, so that is what I've been watching or what I've been reading. I haven't been watching much apart from YouTube. And I did start a new save file for my time at Portia because I've been watching Ash play it. And she's playing it as like preparation for when uh, my time at Sandrock comes out on P PlayStation. And I played it a while ago. Um, it's one of the like cozy genre of like farming sim, crafting life sim type games. And I do like it, but I have a bone to pick with the controls. The controls are really clunky. Um, they're very, they can be very confusing, especially if you're playing multiple games, like switching back and forth between the two is a headache. And the other thing is the way that you get quests. You often don't know that you need to upgrade something unless you Google it. So, you'll be running around trying to find the recipe for something or trying to figure out where you get this one specific item. And then you Google it and discover that, oh, the reason you haven't made this yet is because you have to upgrade something. 
and that upgrade is hideously expensive and it, it, it's just a pain it is it's a pain like I enjoy the game but it's a pain and I have very complicated feelings about this so I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to keep playing on it right now um, I might switch back to Dreamlight Valley because they just had that big update and I haven't even opened it in like a month. So I might go back there, but, um, th the thing about my time at Porsche is that it's been giving me a lot of the serotonin boosts or the dopamine hits for finishing tasks. So that's the main reason I've been playing it. So I think that that is all I've got for podcast content today, and I've been talking for 48 minutes, so this is going to need to get cut down in post. Um, let's move on to our spooky story. We're doing another Know Your Cryptid segment, and I'm kind of combining a couple of different cryptids into this one. So grab your knitting, grab some tea, curl up, and let's talk about some spooky stuff, okay? We're going to keep it short and sweet today since the podcast ran a bit long. For this installment of Know Your Cryptids, we're looking at shadow people. Depending on who you ask, these might be considered more paranormal phenomena than a cryptid, but just roll with me for a minute here. Also, it's my show and Know Your Cryptids is catchier than Know Your Paranormal Phenomena. I think most everyone has had an experience with shadow people at some point in their life, whether it's that fleeting movement out of the corner of your eye or the figure that watches you from the foot of your childhood bed. There are a lot of explanations for this, from optical illusions and sleep paralysis to aliens and ghosts, but there are some things that all shadow people have in common. They're usually featureless, the size of an adult, and darker than the darkness around them. They don't speak and seldom move, though sometimes they hover or glide around, and very rarely you might see one walk or run, darting across a room as though afraid of being spotted. There's one subset of shadow people I want to mention in particular, however, because it shows up in Midnight Radio, and that's the Hat Man. The Hat Man, like other shadow figures, is generally very tall and slender, appearing as a darker void in an already darkened room. As the name suggests, however, it does have two distinct features. The silhouette resembles a man in a fedora and trench coat. The hat man is distinct because it also may or may not have red or black eyes. Typically, it stands in a corner, watching, observing, or maybe leaning over you as you try to sleep. But by and large, it's harmless and keeps its distance, even if sleep paralysis and the sensation of being watched while you sleep can cause feelings of fear and panic. While shadow figures of various types associated with sleep paralysis can be found across every culture, the hat man specifically is the nuke eye. Many scientists believe that this is because the fedora is the brain reworking the black shadow person template, so to speak, to match with something from popular culture, like Indiana Jones or a film noir detective. While descriptions of shadow people go back decades at least, the hat man seems to have started showing up in the 2000s when he began to visit the dreams and waking states of hundreds of people. In my own writing, I've used him as an ill omen and a hint that all is not as it seems. Who is he? Why does he seem intent on watching our main characters? Well, you'll just have to read the book to find out. Thank you so much for joining me tonight, and I hope that you enjoyed yourself as much as I did. If you did, make sure that you like, comment, subscribe, share, and you will find links to everything that I talked about down below. And don't forget to check out Midnight Radio, which is a 1950s Scooby-Doo Call of Cthulhu type of mystery involving three neurodivergent teens that comes out on April 22nd. It's available for pre-order for just 99 cents right now on Amazon. Link down below. Ciao!